on a given mission, when you go out the door, exactly what you're going to run into as far as what the target is, you know, what, what locate, where the location is, the elevation, the, uh, the threats that are around it. You have to decide, what am I going to do to take out this target today, given all these different variable conditions? For most aviators, a blue sky is an invitation to pull the aircraft off the runway, light the afterburners, and point upwards. Not so for the attackers. These are the pilots and the aircraft that are tasked to the air to ground and the close air support mission. They bring fast moving aerial firepower to bear on the battlefield. Their tactics combine deception, high G maneuvering, and plain air to ground power. Uh, Angels 2-4 is 2-5, sir. We'd like to, uh, we'd like to bubble at uh, Angels 2-5, sir. Well, there's uh, many different things we can do in the attack role. Uh, we can do a, a high-altitude profile, which is uh, a lot of what we did in, uh, in the Gulf. Uh, we're also trained in uh, the low-level environment, 200 feet, 500 knots, uh, racing around with a hair on fire, and then we'll uh, pop up doing, a, doing like an afterburner climb, just climbing up high and then, and then diving in. So usually it's uh, bomb delivery is normally a uh, uh, visual 40-degree dive type. Uh, with about a 6 or 7 G pull out. Fighter pilots are guys who go up and fight other airplanes and, uh, and oh, by the way, drop bombs. Uh, attack pilots are guys that fight airplanes and drop bombs. What makes most A-10 pilots love to fly the A-10, it's not so much the airplane, it's the mission that we do. And personally speaking for me, and most A-10 pilots, I think, feel the same way, we would get bored doing, uh, say, the, the air-to-air type mission where you just go out and practice the uh, you know, air-to-air intercepts, dogfighting, that kind of stuff every day. Most of us get a real kick and enjoy flying the A-10 because we're flying down close to the treetops at high speeds and dropping bombs on target. And there's a very uh, strong sense of satisfaction of getting, of getting immediate feedback from your, your bomb pass because you can see it land on the target. You can tell if you hit it. Flying low is very exciting. The, uh, there's nothing like the rush at, at 200 feet and 500 knots with, the, with, a, with a canyon going by. Uh, in fact, it's even more impressive when you when you kind of turn up and you're at an 80 degree angle of bank turn at you know that fast, pulling five G's to get around the corner, and that's when the ground really you feel the rush, and uh, it is quite a thrill. We're, we're designed to operate in the weeds and. Uh, saying goes, we're down in the weeds with our hair on fire, trying to stay out of uh, the enemy's way. If we're flying through a, a AAA or SAM environment, we're going to need to be maneuvering the jet constantly. And this is four, five, six G uh, maneuvering in what we call a glib maneuver. Um, there's different ones for different system, but it's basically uh, uh, weird angles and, 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 and just a, a lot of hard up and down, left and right turning. At the same time, you're navigating, getting your system all set up, keeping the sh an eye on your wingman and also looking over your shoulder checking for uh, checking for the bad guy so uh, definitely down low it, it, it's 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 much more demanding and you're pretty whipped by the time you do even a one-hour flight down there the f-16 in the air to ground roll is uh, literally unsurpassed of any fighter uh, in the world in my personal opinion now I'm a bit prejudiced because I fly the aircraft but the aircraft is extremely agile and it's extremely accurate and the cockpit visibility afforded the pilot is uh, phenomenal. The onboard avionics to, uh, assist tremendously with navigation to the target. You have uh, tremendous thrust so the aircraft can maintain uh, very high combat speeds and does not lose much speed during a very tight turn. Our ability to turn and move very tightly uh, is a tremendous asset in negating enemy gunners and 
defeating surface terror missiles that may be launched at us, we can actually turn and uh, give them a turn that they cannot uh, follow us through. Marine Corps' primary mission is to attack, seize, and defend advanced naval bases in the continuation of a land war ashore. The principal mission of the av is to provide uh, immediate close air support to the Marines on the ground. We exist solely to add additional fire support to our troops, and due to the V-stall capability, we can uh, add a lot of flexibility to our basing so that we can remain close to the frontline troops and respond immediately to their calls. We exist, and the A-10 exists, in the close air support concept in order to support the Army from the air in their close in conduct, and then some other of our aircraft, the fighters, the uh, high-altitude interdictors, the F-15s, the 16s, et cetera, exist to support us or keep the bad air force off of our back, so to speak, so that we can do our jobs, so that the Army can do their jobs, so that in the end, this combined team concept comes out a, a victor. It's probably one of the most overtasking environments you'll get in coming in at uh, eight to nine miles a minute. You're popping up into your attack. As you're popping into your attack, your fax has got to get his eyes on you to see that you're pointing in the right direction. As we roll in, we'll give a wings level call. He's looking to make sure our nose is pointing in the right direction. We're trying to acquire the friendlies to uh, determine where they're at. Uh, and yes, there is. There's a lot of dust around. There's a lot of smoke. Um, there can be a lot of explosions going off and so on. And then you're trying to look ahead first thing you want to try to do is pick out where your friendlies are, and then you want to look ahead and try to pick out and acquire the target as you're going in. The fact's giving you uh, wings level called, clear it hot. Uh, you're responding to that, going to try to hit the target, and it's depending on what the enemy threat's like out there, uh, it can be very uh, overloading at times. Attackers fly with the battlefield. Their movement controlled from the ground by facts or forward air controllers. Attack jets, armored mobile platforms for powerful weaponry, are designed and equipped according to their mission. The AV-8 Harrier, using its vertical flight capabilities and quick acceleration, flies close to the lines, leapfrogging the front and immediate support of ground forces. The A-10 Warthog, targeting tanks and armored vehicles, incorporates a heavily armored titanium bathtub to protect its pilot. Forward of the battlefield, the F-A-16 interdicts enemy assets while relying on its speed and agility to avoid hostile fire. As a ground forward air controller, of course, my job is uh, getting the fighter's eyes on the target. And if I can't mark it, at least to get his eyes on it to where he hits the target. Very favorably impressed with the A-16. It'd come in fast, find the target, hit it, and leave. And, uh... That's all a ground fac uh, really needs out of an airplane. Uh, this aircraft has four attributes that I consider very important to do casts in the year 2000 and beyond. Uh, you must be able, I think you must be very small yet agile. You must be able to carry a very respectable load of ordnance. You have to deliver that ordnance very accurately. And in addition, you have to be able to do that at nighttime as easily as you can do it in daytime. Hold on, Crockett 3-2. Crockett 3-2, go ahead. Crockett pulled up, two, check. Four zero past the air request. Alpha two. Clock three two. Say that authentication again. Flash ma'am. Two Alpha. Kilo India. Clock three two is checking in with you at four one past the hour. Going back. At base plus five. Requesting sweet and sour. Clock three two have negative contact. You're gonna have to give me a pause at first. Ma'am, uh, clock at three two is two to five on Delaware. Stand by, Surgeon. 774, seven, seven, push, yellow, three. Nickelope, one, one, check. Two. Bulldog, crush, zero, three. Crush, zero, three, go ahead. Crush, zero, three, airborne has fragged on the Delaware, one, two, zero, at ten. Crush, stand by, unable to give you a uh, radar. When you pre-flight the F-16, you start with the forms. Uh, as every good aviator knows, uh, checking the forms, uh, the recent maintenance that's been done, any outstanding write-ups that may be on the aircraft, how it's been performing over its last few flights is very important. It gives you a, a feel for the aircraft before you ever get in it. We move uh, clockwise around the aircraft. We go around the nose of the airplane, checking that all the uh, 
pitot tubes and the air data sensor ports are clear of obstructions. We check the engine bay to make sure that the uh, engine inlet bay to make sure that the opening is clear and no obstructions. Uh, we move around to the right side of the aircraft and, and check that the gun has been armed. That's actually the point where they set the rounds limiter to, to allow you to shoot the gun. Then we go up into the wheel well and check it, and then you check the right wing ordnance to ensure that it's properly loaded, the fuses are set right, the uh, carts that will actually fire and release the bomb are in place. You check your right wing uh, missile and make sure that it's uh, full up and ready to go. Then you check the, uh, the back end of the airplane to ensure the tail hook is good and the pin has been removed so it will work. And you check the uh, outlet for the engine to make sure the nozzles are in good uh, working order and that there appears to be no hot spots on the engine that have recently been discolored or burned through. Then you move back around to the left side of the airplane and uh, basically mirror image of the right side to ensure that um, all the switches are set properly, that the wingtip missile's in good shape, the ordnance on the left wing is good. We carry the sidewinder heat-seeking missiles on the wingtips. Uh, we also can carry two underwing missiles on the immediate inboard station from the wings, uh, giving us the capability to carry four sidewinders into battle, which we generally did in Desert Storm. Uh, next stations are bomb stations, and we can load either pylon-mounted 2,000-pound uh, Mark 84-type uh, bombs, or we can put a triple ejector rack on there that will hold uh, three munitions of various types, and we did carry all the types there are to carry. We carried cluster bomb units, CBUs, we carried Mark 82 uh, bombs, and we also single mounted some uh, Mavericks, AGM-65, uh, the TV or infrared uh, guided missiles. The uh, next two stations coming in right next to the fuselage, uh, just due to the ranges we had to travel, they can either carry munitions or wing fuel tanks, and we generally loaded the wing fuel tanks on there to extend our range. On the center line station, we can uh, either load a single bomb, a fuel tank, or an ECM pod, electronic count countermeasure pod which we carried uh, during Desert Storm to negate enemy radars and to defeat enemy missiles that may have onboard radars. To sit in the cockpit of the F-16 is the closest ex experience I think that man can actually have to flying himself. Uh, when I first started to fly the aircraft, I felt almost vulnerable because you sit up uh, so high in this bubble canopy, literally there is nothing around you from your knees up. You are just completely out in the wind stream, protected only by this thin plate of plexiglass. Once you become accustomed to that feeling, um, because you don't have the wings in your peripheral vision, uh, you, you literally feel like it is you that is actually flying. taxi out, uh, you uh, either continue with uh, programming your store's management system or uh, reviewing what's going to happen immediately after takeoff. Uh, just as a technique, most of the guys will review emergencies on takeoff. What if? What if the engine fails on takeoff? What if I uh, have some type of gear malfunction on takeoff? The critical action things that require instantaneous action where you don't have a whole lot of time to think, guys will try to think about those ahead of time so they proper, properly react uh, if the problem comes up. The F-16 has such great thrust uh, that you cannot run the engine up to 100% to check it uh, because the brakes will not hold the airplane in place. And so we generally run the engine up to 80% and we have preset values that we check. You do that and then you stir the stick and make sure the flight controls are good. Everybody's sitting there running at 80% power. And then you pass head nods up the line to say my airplane's good. Once the head nod, final head nod gets to the flight lead, he releases brakes and advances the throttle to full military or to afterburner, depending on the type of takeoff. The afterburner has five stages. 
they light one at a time, uh, about one second apart, and you can actually feel all five stages kick in. You mentally count as each uh, stage of afterburner lights, and you can glance down and see the nozzles open up a little bit more as each stage of burner lights. By the time the fifth stage kicks in, you're you're it's like being in a jet fuel dragster. Uh, depending on the load you have, about the time the fifth stage kicks in, the nose wheel steering's coming off because now the airplane is going fast enough to steer with air pressure across the rudder. And uh, you go back to the airspeed indicator, and generally by now the airspeed indicator is jumping up close to 150 knots, and it's getting to be time to start putting that back pressure on the stick. The thought of back pressure is about all it takes to get the airplane in the air as the F-16 uh, is so aerodynamic it wants to leap into the air. powerful air-to-ground fighting machine is the A-10 Warthog. It carries the seven-barreled 30-millimeter Avenger Gatling gun. It has 11 hard points for armament, and it proved to be a deadly platform for the Maverick missile. With its big 58-foot wingspan, the A-10 is built to move low and slow over the battlefield. popular saying goes in the A-10, and I think this describes it very well, is one day a bunch of engineers were sitting around the table, and they uh, had this fantastic Gatling gun that just pours out these huge 30 millimeter shells at a very rapid rate, and they kind of scratched their head and said, hmm, I wonder if we can make this thing fly, and that's how the, the A-10 was born, because these guys decided they were going to make this gun fly, so they built the A-10 around the gun. The gun itself, uh, you know, very powerful 30 millimeter. It fires around 4,000 rounds a minute, so it's really pouring out a lot of lead. Our real weapon of choice for the A-10, obviously, is the Maverick missile, and uh, that's usually carried just a few stations in from the wingtip. The uh, Maverick uh, missile is a precision guided weapon in that it uh, is able to lock on to a specific target, either using light contrast, like you would on a black and white TV set, or using a heat source, heat contrast, between the actual target and the, its background, whether it's hotter or colder, and gives you a blip on side the screen on the aircraft that way. And you're able to lock this missile onto that specific target. And once the uh, Maverick missile has been launched off the aircraft, it's on its own and it will remain locked onto that target. You can just fly away and start heading the other direction while the missile continues to fly at its target. Our uh, standard way to, to, to fight and fly in the A-10 is as a two ship. The two of you can, can, can watch out for each other. It really uh, makes your survivability rate go up uh, you know, tenfold just having two of you there instead of one. My job as a wingman, uh, first and foremost, is to uh, be a good lookout uh, for my lead and, uh, and to be a good formation pilot. I need to be right there so he can look out across his shoulder and he can see me at all times. Uh, that's my number one priority, is being in position. Secondary to that is backing him up on the radar and searching a sector that he assigned me to that uh, his radar scan volume might not cover at that time. The A-10 is a fantastic airplane as far as being able to take a hit and continue to operate. It's got, uh, for one thing, the infamous titanium bathtub, as we like to call it, the, the shielding around the actual pilot that uh, provides protection from a, up to a fairly good-sized uh, a bullet from enemy ground fire will, will bounce off of that thing, and we're all kind of sitting down in that. So it gives you some protection there. And then the other part of that equation is the, the multiple repetitive uh, systems that the A-10 has to where you know, it can lose one hydraulic system and there's a backup. It can even you know, lose one engine for that matter and it has a backup. Made 
System. As soon as I was hit, the right system went to zero, and all the lights in the world came off. Missile went off, and I thought it was the SAM going by, so I started kicking flares out the back. And, uh, good show. Thank you, Robbie. I wish I'd have kept it on the runway for you, but the well, yeah, sure. tire blew, and I just couldn't keep it on there. We got plenty of time. Well, we do now. We got plenty of tires, too, right? <laughs> yeah. You got a crane? Well, <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, I got a crane. Yeah, we're Boy, that Hummer was trying hard to blow you out of the air. Look at that. Operating just feet above the ground is the AV-8B Harrier, a jet truly designed for close-in support. When the Marines put the Harrier into service in 1971, they combined the tactical advantage of a helicopter with the speed of a jet, a plane that could land anywhere from country roads to urban parking lots, jumping back and forth above the lines to stay above the battle but close enough to the ground to keep the pilot's eyes on the target. The advantage of the, uh, of the vector thrust in the Harrier and why the Marine Corps bought it is we will not be tied to a fixed location. For example, a ship out at sea or a specific base um, ashore. We can move to a roadside, a parking lots, and so on, and that can be easily done by bringing in fuel and bombs. We have a base that we called a forward arming refueling point, a FARP site. And we can set those up very quickly, usually within 24 to 48 hours, we can have those set up and operational. What the V-Stall allows us to do is it allows us to land vertically at a confined site, load fuel and bombs onto the aircraft, and do a short takeoff at a couple hundred feet, get airborne, and keep us very close to the flow of the battlefield so that we can respond very quickly to any calls for fire support and close air support.
When you're sitting inside the uh, Harrier, you've got uh, about 22,000 pounds of thrust, approximately five feet behind you, and the intakes are about one foot behind you. So uh, from engine start up to engine shutdown, you're very aware of the tremendous power that's parked right behind you. You've got that Rolls-Royce engine just growling right behind you, and when you go to max power to take off, you know you're at full power, and uh, that's why I think a lot of us wear double ear protection when we fly that aircraft. The Harrier can vector its thrust from zero degrees down to 98 degrees. The aircraft's standard attitude is sitting at eight degrees up, so when we put our nozzles all the way forward at 98 degrees, we can actually point the nozzles forward 16 degrees. What that can do for us is give us incredible deceleration at high air speeds, which can be very advantageous in a dogfight. The front two are the cold nozzles, uh, which puts out air up to uh, 700 knots at about 100 degrees. It's coming off the turbofan. Right behind there, you have the hot nozzles, which is where the exhaust comes out right after the burner section. It'll come out there at about 1,000 knots at about 700 degrees Celsius. seems like chaos. A careful choreography is designed to coordinate the mix of aircraft in and out of the threat. Flying above the battle in a C-130, an airborne battlefield command and control center puts the right plane on the right target to deliver maximum firepower in support of troops on the ground. The forward air controller evaluates the situation and uh, goes forward to a uh, AP Triple C, a C-130 command post, if you will. Uh, that uh, they may forward that information directly to the AWACS, um, who we were in contact with en route to the uh, Iraqi airspace. The AWACS would have us contact the AB Triple C prior to entering enemy uh, airspace, and the AB Triple C would task us to contact the Army Forward Air Controller. As we approach the area, we would contact him, and he would relay uh, information because he's in direct communications with the Army commander on the ground. Target 
target all the way over to the right of the house. Other three it's always positive control from uh, all the way from the ground people on up. We go ahead and talk to uh, ground facts, forward air controllers, and obviously we have to deconflict. We're working closely with um, friendly troops within a few miles with the targets, or sometimes even less. So, um, it, in that case, it's definitely a very controlled uh, environment, um, and you know some of the missions can take up to half an hour prior to even putting a bomb on target to make sure that we have the right target uh, and everything's deconflicted with um, our friendly forces. We would generally ingress at a medium-type altitude, drop down uh, as required to locate the target or to find a target if we uh, had the option to do that. And then we would set up an attack and the flight members would attack that particular target and then we would egress. And uh, once we were departing the area, we would generally contact AWACS, or the airborne controllers, uh, to see if they had any additional tasking for us. Target acquisition is one of the most difficult things, especially in a close air support environment where we're usually not going after a fixed target like a bridge or something. It's usually more of a dynamic environment. You might have units out there maneuvering, and to be able to acquire those, you have to get some elevation. You have to get that overhead view looking down upon the battle scene to best acquire the target, distinguish friendlies from enemies, and roll in and get your bombs on target. monitor um, in a bomb run is our head, heads up display and that's uh, invaluable during a bombing run because it keeps your head out of the cockpit and especially in a combat scenario where you're rolling in and they could be possibly firing at you and you need to be acquiring a target it's very important. Um, what we do we have set parameters depending on the event that we're delivering. Um, we drop over there we normally drop the bombs out of a, a dive bomb and uh, you may have seen like the old footage of World War II and the Stuttgart dive bomber coming down about 90 degrees wasn't quite that much, but uh, we normally drop out of a 45-degree dive bomb pass. And and then from there on, it's just uh, using your heads-up display and the known parameters and release altitudes, uh, rolling in on the target. And, you know, you could, once you acquire a target, you could probably roll in on it within 30 seconds. Once we, we get down to low altitude, uh, the F-16 pilot's number one threat at that altitude is guns, AAA anti-aircraft fire or either handheld uh, rifles just being pointed in the air, a bullet in, a, in the right place in the engine or flight controls can do some damage. And uh, he is trying to n deny a tracking solution at low altitude uh, to negate that gunner. As we get to low altitude, we begin maneuvering the airplane. Uh, in the event someone's shooting at us, we try to be as unpredictable as possible and uh, deny them that tracking solution before they're ever even pulling the trigger. Um, 
use my weapon systems and my countermeasure systems in my aircraft to best increase my survivability. As you look over the jet as you're flying into there, you see people actually shooting at you, and you can see the explosions uh, a little bit down below the jet, and you realize that those are the people actually trying to shoot you out of the air. So it's almost uh, uh, in a fight content where you you know people are throwing stones at you, and you want to kind of get a little ticked off, and you go, whoa, let's, let's take this guy out. So um, but basically, the, the scenario, what happened was we launched off alert yesterday morning, and uh, they were calling for us to get up there and help them. Uh, we got up there. Uh, as we crossed the border, I mean, immediately people started shooting at us, you know, and then again, that's, that gets your attention when you see little puffs of smoke going by your plane. Um, so we were talking to what we call a FAC, a forward air controller, and he was trying to talk us in on a uh, specific point uh, for us to hit. Um, needless to say, uh, we, we took that the point out, and there was a whole bunch of targets that were down there on the ground, and we just, um, I don't want to say surgically removed, but we removed the ones that uh, we, were, we were trying to remove that looked like they were going to cause the most problems for our units. There was some chatter on the radio, people talking, and as soon as they started getting hot bandit calls southbound, like, boom, no more talking. The ALAX uh, controller was the only person talking. Uh, people were really interested in uh, what's happening. As soon as they turned south, a lot, a lot of relief in the uh, voices. Continued on as we started approaching in there. I was just thinking, gee whiz, you know, we're really going to do it. Saw the target, rolled in there, and after that it was just just like shooting a practice round or going out there and training like we do every day. Saw the target and let her rip. And the, everything we dropped, everything we shot, the jets, everything uh, worked, worked as advertised. Well, uh, there's a lot of holes in the desert. <laughs> Uh, a lot of bombs have been going off. There's still a lot of uh, a lot of what we call bad guys up there. We saw some running down the road today. Saw a lot of vehicles and things and revetments, but uh, a lot of holes in the ground. But there's still a lot of targets too. We had uh, so many aircraft uh, waiting that the uh, forward air controllers could not handle us quickly enough to funnel us into the fray. I held for approximately 20 minutes. Told him uh, either find me a target or I'm going to go on an arm recce, and uh, he finally. Uh, Passed me army barracks for a uh, secondary target. We headed north across the uh, border and uh, found a target of opportunity, which looked like a truck park slash uh, supply dump. And uh, we expended ordnance on that. There was a lot of smoke out there on the uh, battleground, a lot of uh, things burning, uh, vehicles, oil wells, some uh, light scattered AAA. We did not encounter uh, very much in the way of AAA on our particular attack run. Uh, no enemy aircraft. I saw an occasional uh, in SAM indication on my uh, sensors, but uh, nothing serious. We always talk about making the next bomb better. And sometimes it's tough to recognize what you did wrong, but um, we, um, you normally, you know, you look at it and you can say, oh, I, I was steep or the winds were this and that and not what I thought they were. And you come back around and get it better. Just the other day from over here, I uh, lost all my right side hydraulics. Uh, just, you know, the system just failed and a line ruptured. Uh, again, from the day we get into pilot training, and even before you even step in the first airplane, um, the other thing they stress is emergency procedures, and we practice every day that. Every briefing we, we uh, go through an emergency. Um, every month we need to go and sit in the trainer and practice them. Um, so uh, we get good at it, and as you, as you probably can imagine, emergencies can get bad really fast. There is a necessary amount of danger that you have to uh, be willing to accept when you go out to do your job, because that's that's just part of the game, and we have to do that, and we're all willing to take that chance. It's pretty incredible when, uh, I mean, that was my 39th mission, and, uh, you know, I've been flying out, I've been shot at a lot, but hadn't got hit, so when I finally get hit, it's, it, it's actually an initial, just, it, it's anger. It's like, God, I can't believe, you know, I got hit, these guys got me. I'm looking at all these lights lighting up in the cockpit, just going, there's a fire light. I've always wondered when that thing would go off, and, and then I confirmed I was on fire. And uh, people asked me, they said, what were your caution lights saying? They're all the yellow ones. I said, hey, I had so many red ones going off. I didn't really get too concerned about the yellow ones. We got over there. Uh, the younger guys uh, criticized some of us older guys.
for not being as intense as they thought we should be. You know, and, and I got down to them one day and I said, you know, it really doesn't matter if you if you know that the uh, head of an SA-6 has 16 titanium bolts holding it on there and they've got a, a one-inch pitch and uh, 45 threads to the, to the inch. What matters is how long it burns, how fast it goes, and how, how you maneuver away from it. The ability to compartmentalize is very important in a military pilot. In other words, I've got to be able to walk out of this office and uh, and put aside all the questions, all the problems, all of my, my own personal problems, too, and walk over there, and when the door closes on the briefing room, I am now 100% in that room planning that flight, and when I climb in that airplane and close that canopy, that canopy is just closed out the rest of the world except for my mission. In the hearing community, we all tend to be a bunch of individualists. I'll bet if you take uh, 10 people out, they'll land the aircraft 10 different ways. Um, based on a, on a landing rollout that we want to achieve is pretty much going to determine how much nozzles we're going to deflect in our landing. Anywhere from zero up to 82 in a hover um, is what we'll deflect. If I want to roll out about 1,000 feet, I'll probably come in with a maybe a 70 nozzle, uh, 60 knot landing. Um, if I'm going to a confined site coming off the perch, I'll, uh, I'll roll in and is approaching my pad. I'll go ahead and bring it right into what we call the hover stop, 82 degrees, and slow the aircraft down. If it's uh, real hot out and I'm real heavy and I don't have a hover capability and I want to roll out, then, uh, then maybe I'll use a 50 nozzle rollout. You're generally doing somewhere between three and 400 knots as you approach the field. You start uh, in that hard turn, you're actually doing a 180 degree turn to parallel the runway. You're trying to slow down to about 200 knots and uh, generally if you've done it right and you've managed your throttle properly, you're hitting about 200 knots as you're rolling wings level on downwind. You uh, lower the landing gear. The F-16 is uh, unique in that it has no flap switch. The landing gear is a gear and flap handle in that the flaps are automatically positioned when you lower the landing gear. Once the gear comes down in place, uh, you check that you have three green lights, a quick check over to the hydraulic pressure to ensure that it is in the acceptable region. Coming across the left-hand turn, uh, flying about 11 units angle of attack for the F-16. Uh, you check that halfway through the turn, you've lost half your altitude, you're 90 degrees to the runway now. Uh, as you start rolling out on final, the power's coming back and the pitch is decreasing to about two and a half degrees. From there, it's simply a visual uh, fly the aircraft down to uh, the touchdown zone, adjusting the airspeed to try to get the airplane on the ground. One thing about the F-16, it wants to fly so much that you really need to be on speed. If you're a little bit fast, the airplane will balloon or bounce very easily just because it wants to stay in the air. And it's a very difficult airplane to get to sit on the ground. Being on speed on final is a very important thing in the F-16. the attackers live and fly in a difficult, low-level environment. The lessons learned from the Persian Gulf have already been incorporated into the training of new pilots. Technology will improve, adding yet newer capabilities for the attackers, while tactics will become more sophisticated as the battlefield of the future evolves. Roman 7 does control. Roger. Duties 25, altimeter 2973. Wind clear to the west block 1200. Report the initial to the tower today. 